Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the November 21st, 2019 uh, regular meeting for the City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission. Uh, we'll call the meeting to order and request a roll call, please. Commissioner Schifrin? Here. Commissioner Conway? Here. Commissioner Nielsen? Here. Commissioner Greenberg? Here. Commissioner Singleton? Noting absent, I'll confirm with or without notification. Um, Vice Chair Spellman? Here. Chair Pepping? <clears throat> Present. And Commissioner Singleton is absent with notification. Great, thank yeah. you. Are there any statements of disqualification for the agendized items tonight? Seeing none, um, the next item on our agenda is oral communications. For what we have agendized, we'll welcome public comment on those items. This section is for <coughs> public comment from anyone who wants to speak to the commission that anything pertains to our business but is not on tonight's agenda. Is anyone um, wishing to address the commission on those matters? Seeing none, we'll move to the next item. It's approval of minutes. Uh, would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the August 15th meeting or discussion of changes. So, so moved. I just have one quick change, which is that my name is not on the roll call, and it should be. Did you catch that? Commissioner Greenberg's name is not on there. Was there a second? Do you second that motion? Second. Second with the amendment. Change. All in favor? Aye. 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 I believe I was absent August 15th, so I was absent as well those abstentions okay so minutes pass and then I would enter, entertain a motion for the special meeting November 14th meeting <coughs> motion to approve minutes for November 14th 2019 I thought the, we have two minutes yeah, we have all two second questions. any discussion or amendments it was the last last week's meeting first one was <coughs> the 15th this was November 14th Those are posted, so I'll, I'll let you abstain if you wish, Commissioner Schifrin. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 I'll, I'll vote in favor in the hopes that the minutes do reflect my uh, request to have the record show why I voted for the motion. Okay. I, I didn't realize that, that those minutes had been sent out. We have a very interesting process uh, in this age of the Internet of changing the agenda after it's first posted, and when I think of when it was first posted, now I missed it, and I'm sorry. Uh, and I'll abstain. I was absent. Okay, so did you catch those votes? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so the next item is a presentation, I believe, from Dr. Tiffany Wise West on the Resilient Coast Santa Cruz Project. Welcome. Thank you very much. Good evening, Commissioners. Tiffany Wise West, Sustainability and Climate Action Manager for the City of Santa Cruz, and I'm delighted to be here this evening to share with you our progress on the Resilient Coast Santa Cruz Initiative. So we have the need to address a number of things with respect to coastal management. Everything from access to transportation to habitat and ecosystems to sense of place and cultural identity and equity. And we are doing so through an inclusive concert, uh, conversation in order to create a community vision for what resilient coastal management in the face of climate change looks like that has a timeline out through year 2100 with the aim of achieving a resilient and equitably accessed coastline. So the Resilient Coast Initiative is really comprised of two projects. The first is a Westcliff Drive Adaptation and Management Plan. And the second, we really just call our Beaches Project because this is a mouthful, but it's the development of local coastal programs, sea level rise strategies and policies that support beach and public access protection. And just to remind you, the LCP is the policy document that when certified by the Coastal Commission allows us to issue uh, most coastal development permits that are consistent with the Coastal Act. Um, on this project or these two projects, we have an internal team that's working on this as well as a 17 member technical advisory committee of which uh, Commissioner Schifrin is your representative from the Planning Commission. So just a few things to uh, kind of remind you why we're doing this project. 
So you may remember about a year ago when we adopted our 2018 climate adaptation plan. This is an image from our very first sea level rise vulnerability assessment. And what you're seeing is all of that blue shaded area that is located down in the beach flats, the lower lo ocean area, and over at Neary Lagoon, as well as a running along the coastline, are the combined effects of climate change. So that would be rising tide, coastal storm flooding, and erosion. And the darker the color is the closer to now, our baseline year was 2010. And the lighter the color, the shades of blue, is further out towards 2100, um, our uh, kind of furthest out time horizon. And really no big surprises here. We have increased flooding down in our beach flats and lower ocean area. We have increased erosion and flooding over at Arana Gulch, as well as some uh, near Neary Lagoon. Bethany Curve and over at Natural Bridges. And we have potentially up to um, into the first block of erosion along uh, West Cliff. That is if we did nothing at all. We also have over two dozen access points along uh, the coastline and uh, at some of the waterways that um, lead to the coastline. Um, that also coincide with these hazard zones, these coastal hazard zones. And we have nearly two dozen surf breaks that are also located there, which we have projected that between 2040 and 2060, we could see um, the, the surf breaks between Cow Beach and Steamer Lane be drowned out. We also have habitat, so all of these shaded areas are sensitive habitat, both aquatic and terrestrial. And you can see that much of those sensitive habitat areas overlap with our hazard zones. So again, another thing that we are looking at is how can we ensure that we pro provide connectivity to alternative habitat sites if habitat is impacted by erosion or flooding or whatnot or increased temperature for that matter. And that those that orange that you see above is also our fire hazard zones, not just the uh, coastal hazards that we're showing here. Of course, we have people, and this is a slide you've also seen before. Uh, we did build a social vulnerability to climate change assessment uh, last year, where we looked at the incidence of uh, poverty, crime, disability, age, um, and English not spoken as a first language, building a score by census block group and ranking them relative to one another, where you see the red census block groups are those with the highest social vulnerability and the green are those with the lowest. And you can see the arrows point to a couple areas along the coast, namely uh, the red area, kind of a, a greater beach, beach flats area where um, high social vulnerability is driven by the incidence of uh, Spanish speakers and low incomes. And uh, you see medium high social vulnerability over that orange area on the west side of Santa Cruz, which is driven primarily by the incidence of elderly folks. And so we're using this, uh, this tool to understand the drivers of social vulnerability, where they overlap with our coastal hazard zones, and how can we tailor strategies that help these people the most. And this uh, these projects, this initiative has a central focus on equity, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. These are some images actually from the projects. What could happen to West Cliff Drive if we took no action at all on sea level rise and coastal storms? So you see in the upper right hand corner, this is a very typical profile. Over 50% of West Cliff Drive is actually armored mostly by riprap, otherwise known as revetment. The, those are those big boulders that are stacked up. Some of those are up to five tons in weight, believe it or not. So this shows uh, a nicely stacked revetment that's performing as intended, uh, preventing a wave attack on the bluff. But as you continue down lower, you see that with sea level rise, that nice dry pocket beach is starting to become reduced in width. That's exacerbated by the displacement of that revetment or that riprap where it is no longer fully serving its purpose and we potentially might have erosion of that habitat area and potentially um, our bike ped path. And if we allowed that to continue further, we would see that eventually we would lose that pocket beach, the riprap would no longer serve its purpose and we could encroach into uh, the Westcliff Drive itself. 
Similarly, what could happen with the beaches is a very similar kind of evolution of coastal change. So we have a, a densely developed um, area behind a very short seawall, a nice expanse of dry beach. This is very typical of Maine Beach, say. And as you go through time, you see with sea level rise that the width of the beach uh, begins to narrow, that we're losing sand, and eventually we could see under some conditions overtopping of that seawall and that flooding that we saw in that 2D map um, that I started with. So how we are trying to, the approach we're trying to take with these projects is called adaptation pathways. Because there is uncertainty as to when, if and when, we will see these kinds of impacts, it's difficult to plan for them when you peg them to a specific time horizon. Then you make and make, may make investments too early or too late. So taking this adaptation pathways approach instead ties the initiation of whether it's planning or, or some kind of implementation of infrastructure to actually physical triggers. This image that I'm showing you is from Imperial Beach. We're in the process of developing our own now, but this is very illustrative of a typical visualization of adaptation pathways. You see across the top um, depth of sea level rise is the trigger that's being utilized in this case. They did also put some projections on the anticipated time horizon. And you see that um, between zero and 1.6 feet, they intend to maintain their existing armoring at some point, replacing the riprap uh, with a seawall. And at 1.6 feet, they need to transition into sediment management while beginning um, to plan for elevating roadways and structures. So we will be developing these kinds of visualizations that you can look at a glance to see for different profiles along the coastline, what is the plan going forward? Uh, one other thing here, these are typical kinds of triggers that we are considering right now. So depth of sea level rise, things like repetitive loss, uh, width of beach, for example. These are various examples of triggers that we are um, considering right now. So the project really got started in earnest uh, in June. We were contracting th uh, April through June, and there are essentially three phases to this project. We are just finishing up the first phase, which is really the benchmarking and data collection, and I'll give you some more de specific details on each of the projects. We then turn towards the end of the year, after the end of the year, into phase two, which is analysis of the adaptation options, where we will be identifying and starting to analyze those options for their, their uh, cost feasibility, regulatory feasibility, and what the community would like to see as well, what their preferences are. And then uh, these projects run to the end of 2020. So our third uh, phase will be to develop the actual plans and policies. And every stretch of the way, these red stars indicate we have a lot of outreach that has already been conducted, which I'll share with you, and planned for this project. We really want this to be a community-informed and community-driven process. So on the West Cliff Drive plan, we are very fortunate that this uh, this project is being led. It was competitively uh, bid and uh, Revel Coastal, which is uh, Dave Revel is a local geomorphologist, um, is leading a team of Gary Griggs, Charles Lester, who's the former Coastal Commission Executive Director, um, Groundswell Coastal Ecology, uh, Central Coast Wetlands Group, who completed our sea level rise vulnerability assessment, Haru Kasunich and Associates are the engineers, and Fair and Piers are the uh, plan, uh, transportation planners. This is a grant from Caltrans. We do have a $44,000 match that we're bringing in. And the TAC has just finished reviewing uh, Deliverable 1, which is the existing conditions inventory, and uh, the future hazard projections are coming very soon. Uh, this deliverable is due at the end of the year, and you can see the other deliverables that are ahead. The scope of work is somewhat similar, but not entirely to the Beaches Project, which is funded by the California Coastal Commission. We have a much more significant match in the form of primarily labor and a little bit of cash. Um, we have aligned these projects together so that their um, due dates are at the same time so that we can optimize our technical advisory committee's time and we can coordinate our outreach together. So that's really beneficial and we're grateful to the to the funders for allowing us to do that. And in fact, both projects are benefiting 
<clears throat> excuse me, from an outreach specialist we've been able to hire, and the Coastal Commission has said, yes, please integrate that with your Westcliff project. We think we'll be getting better products. So the policy and strategy analysis um, is, again, just got uh, the tech just completed reviewing this on Monday. It'll be due at the end of the year, and then we're turning into the socially vulnerable populations impact analysis, and you can see uh, the rest of the deliverables that are uh, coming after that. So in terms of the community outreach, we've really broken this into kind of a number of touch points. We're just, we have just finished up introducing the project. We really wanted to spend some time building relationships in the community, particularly with underrepresented communities, building on the foundation that we started in the adaptation plan where we did a number of uh, events uh, with underrepresented communities and really doing some community visioning, asking folks, how do you use the coastline? What are you concerned about with the coastline? Uh, uh, what, what kind of ideas might you have? From there, we're turning into, um, we'll be presenting these existing conditions and talking about um, the adaptation strategies and really trying to um, ensure that our residents are informed on the trade-offs of different adaptation strategies, what the costs, relative costs are. So then when we ask for preferences that they really are making some informed um, input to the process. So this is what we've done so far and what's planned. Uh, we've already conducted eight focus groups, 600 surveys on West Cliff Drive where we're asking folks um, some of these things about their uses and so forth. Um, we've done 105 interviews in the Beach Flats and Lower Ocean area and partnering with uh, San Jose State University on that work. And we've already completed 30 talks with community groups and student groups like guest lectures and things like that. In December, we're going to be having one-on-one -on -one meetings with underrepresented groups where we're going to be sharing our methodology for analyzing impacts to those groups and asking them to please tell us, is this method methodology sound? Would you do it differently? And begin to get feedback from them on how coastal change and any adaptations that we're proposing or considering evaluating understanding how they impact these folks in terms of where they live, work, play, and worship. Our virtual reality app uh, shows sea level rise and uh, it starts to introduce some solution concepts that just launched at the library this past Sunday. I encourage you to go and take a look at that. I'll have a slide later on that. We have two community workshops that are gonna be happening in the first half of 2020. And then later in the year, uh, the second phase of our virtual reality application will be out in a mobile phone environment in both Spanish and English. Really think that we can reach a lot of people with that. It will also model solution preferences into, um, into the app. We will have an open house to share after we've kind of heard from the community about what their preferences are and we go back and de develop the plans. We'll have an open house and we'll do those checkbacks with the underrepresented communities to make sure that we are um, getting their feedback on that as well. Just to share with you some of the top coastal concerns, this really breaks it out by different groups, but in a nutshell, there are two major items that we saw consistently across all of the focus groups, and those concerns are around erosion and various facets of transportation. And so um, you can see we've really heard loud and clear that there are conflicts between bikers, pedestrians, and cars on West Cliff Drive, and that's Clearly, Caltrans is funding this transportation is a big focus, so that's something that we aim to address. We asked what's the best thing about West Cliff Drive. Well, even though the biggest concern is the bike ped path, it is identified as the best thing about West Cliff Drive, as are the access to scenic views, the access to viewing and or accessing surfing, getting down to the brakes. We also asked folks, what does resilience mean to you in one word? And these are really the universe of, uh, of terms that we heard. This is really helping us to build goals around these projects. And we have this little chap on the right-hand side that's paging through our adaptation plan at Open Streets where we got to, we gave out over 200 stickers at that event and there were thousands of people there. So that was really a wonderful opportunity to introduce some of this work uh, to the community. In terms of our virtual reality, Sea Level Eyes Explorer, this is such an immersive experience. And again, I really hope that you can make it over to the library to take a look at this. It takes about 10 minutes. 
These are some panels that accompany the activity station at the front of the library that you can check out. This work was funded by the American Geophysicists Union along with some of the funding we already have from Coastal Commission. And uh, here's our fire chief and our emergency operations manager checking this out at a disaster preparedness event that we um, debuted our, um, our virtual reality app at. And again, this is at the library for the next three months. We also have a card game called, that we developed called Cards Against Catastrophe. We've been playing that at some pub nights. Really gives people a feel for the decision making that bodies like yourself and uh, the city council needs to make around investments in emissions reduction and climate adaptation. And it's kind of in a low pressure kind of way that you can play this game and get a feel for that. So with that, um, thank you. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. For all the work and the leadership. Um, Commissioner Schifrin. Well, as a member of the TAC, I feel I incumbent upon me to give my own report. Mm -hmm. uh, staff uh, has done an incredibly excellent uh, job juggling all these issues. Um, there's no two ways about how complicated this whole process is. Not only is it complicated to figure out what, what's going on at West Cliff Drive uh, and as well as what should be done about it, but having two contracts going at the same time with somewhat overlapping areas makes it uh, in concert with a number of regulatory agencies is very, uh, it's a very major undertaking. I, I am very complimentary, of st uh, complimentary to staff about the work that you're doing. Let me just briefly give a couple of points about it. I've, having read over the initial um, reports that have come out, uh, I'm not a technical person in this area. The TAC has many technical people on it who I think are providing helpful input, and of course the consultants are technical experts. But what I got out of it were a couple of things that surprised me. One is that sea level rise, rise data is not very adequate for Santa Cruz. The data is kind of based on a gauge that's in Monterey. Uh, and how relevant it would be to our particular situation is. <clears throat> so one of the recommendations is that the city move forward and get a gauge so that there's better information. The other thing is that sea level rise doesn't seem to appear to be as significant as earlier thought because the land is going up as the sea, sea level is going up. So there's still a good deal of uncertainty about um, just how serious. And what I took out of it is that made me less concerned about sea level rise and more concerned about episodic events. Uh, big storms during high tides, I think, are, are potentially more dangerous to the cliffs than sea level rise over time, in, in the short term over, as opposed to long term. So I thought that was interesting. The other thing that I think is critical is the whole one of the things that this, the information points out is that there are certain, the, the, all the different points along the West Cliff were identified in terms of whether there's a high hazard and whether there's a high risk or a low hazard, low risk. And there are a number of areas that are a high hazard and a high risk. And if you walk on the left West Cliff, you'll know what some of them are. And I think one of the challenges, because there are 50 sites all together, is coming up with a series of adaptations <coughs> that sort of reflect dealing with uh, um, those places that are in the worst shape in, uh, in earlier time in terms of the overall strategy of uh, which I think makes sense, which is responding at the time that, you know, before the problem, but not too far before the problem hits um, so that you're not spending money that doesn't need to be spent for a while. And a lot of this is in a context of not really knowing how long things are going to take. So I think it's an interesting process. I'm going to be, uh, I'm looking forward to getting the particular strategies. Uh, I look forward to try, uh, to the consultants trying to figure out how to make the pedestrians and the bikes on the West Cliff path work within the, uh, the, the, right of way that exists. I mean, I'm, uh, I, I think it'd be great if they can come up with some creative solutions, but it's a real challenge. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to add my, what I've gotten out of the process so far. And Thank thanks, you. Thanks, Steph, for their work on it.
Thanks for that addition and thanks for serving on the subcommittee. Other comments or from commissioners or questions of, of staff? Um, okay. Sure. Um, so um, the focus is on Westcliff Drive and then also the, the red areas that are considered to be the high the high vulnerability areas as well, or is or how does that jive? Yes, I'm, yeah. thank you. I'm sorry, I failed to specify what the exact geographic scope is for both projects. So on the beaches project, we're talking about Seabright, Maine, Cowell, the pocket beaches along Westcliff, and natural bridges. So that's the scope of the LCP update project. And then from Westcliff Drive, it's from the wharf to natural bridges. And so it's essentially the coast and basically one block back. Yes. And I wanted to follow up on uh, Commissioner Schifrin's uh, mention of the tidal gauge. You know, the city's been in active conversation around this very issue for a long time now. And uh, we have reignited these conversations uh, earlier this year, late uh, in the early summer. And so we do think that there is a possibility of doing some cost sharing with the county and there is ongoing maintenance and calibration required on an annual basis that we think USGS and NOAA might be interested in supporting. So it's we're kind of to the point of trying to fit all those puzzle pieces together and get an agreement between those entities. But we all do recognize that having a title gauge here is really critical and that can be utilized for a number of different things beyond tracking the depth of sea level rise. Okay, um, would members of the public like to address the commission on this? We're not taking any action, it's just a presentation, but our meeting guidelines encourage us to um, receive public comment. Would anyone like to address the commission? Okay, uh, I think with that, we'll just say thank you and we look forward to an update and good luck with all of the work. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. You're welcome. So our next agenda item is a public hearing. It's an ordinance amendment on the inclusionary housing requirements ordinance and um, related um, number of things related to council direction and uh, r recommendations from staff. So. We'll, um, Mr. Butler, do you want to start that out with a staff presentation? Sure. Thank you. I'm Lee Butler, the Director of Planning and Community Development, and with me this evening is Bonnie Lipscomb. She is the Director of Economic Development, and um, Bonnie is going to kick off the presentation with uh, a discussion, and I'll be chiming in at times as well. Great. Thanks, Lee. Um, and good evening, uh, Chair Pepping and members of the commission. It's um, my my pleasure to be here this evening. And um, as Lee said, we'll sort of be leading portions of this presentation together. Um, first, I just wanted to start out and give you a little background. Before I go into that, I just want to acknowledge actually the packet that you have, um, which is um, confusing on one level. We actually made a mistake in the attachment. So I just want to briefly explain that we'll go through them step by step together today to clarify that. The first two attachments um, in your packet relate to actions that the council already took. Um, so it's attachments three and four relate to the actions that you will focus on tonight and we'll go through that together. Um, so the background behind what's in front of you this evening relates to our inclusionary um, housing ordinance. And I briefly just wanted to uh, back up a couple of years. And some of, some of you were on the commission, I believe, when this came through uh, previously. But just um, as part of the presentation that we gave to council to provide the context for what's before you this evening, we thought it would be important to give you the background of how we got here. So this is following an 18-month review that started in 2017 of the city's inclusionary ordinance. Um, moving forward in, July, in June of 2018, the city council approved recommendations by the housing blueprint com, uh, subcommittee, which included an over the 100 you know, initial recommendations and included a number um, related to our inclusionary ordinance. This did come through the planning commission in August of 2018. And in October of 2018, the city council approved the changes recommended by the planning commission. 
specifically these changes um, that it were established related to different rental inclusionary requirements for the downtown and outside the downtown. Um, it was determined that inside the downtown, a 15% inclusionary requirement um, was appropriate and, and feasible, and outside the downtown, um, mostly due to what our consultant's perspective was, the difficulty of actually doing density bonus outside the downtown, it was established at 10%. Um, and then additionally, we had changes related to a certain set of circumstances created by statewide case law that's no longer relevant. Um, in January of 20, uh, uh, 2019, a loss, actually that, yeah, that is right. I was thinking it was 2018. 2019, a lawsuit was filed against the city on the grounds that the changes were a violation of Measure O. Measure O is the 1979 uh, measure that established basically our, our inclusionary, our affordable housing requirements in the city. And so our ordinance is based on Measure O, which uh, basically says 15% of a housing, a new housing production in the city will be affordable to persons of average income. And I, I mention that now because that will come up a little bit later in, the, in our conversation. On September 25th, 2019, the city and the plaintiffs executed a settlement agreement settling the lawsuit and overturning the two main changes that I just outlined on the left in the 2018 ordinance. Specifically, these are the sections. You don't really need to know the sections, but if you want to call, call them out later, this relates to removing the designated different inclusionary rates for downtown and outside downtown to just make it 15% citywide. So those, those three changes in, the, in that top left box just relate to that itself. And then the bottom one uh, relates to that specific state case law that I mentioned, um, which allowed the city uh, the council to consider, not necessarily by right, but to consider a reduced inclusionary percentage for projects that fall within a specified time period. Um, and this is that period between 2009 and two, 2018 where we couldn't enforce our rental inclusionary ordinance. So the actual council direction, um, we went through in the settlement changes on October 26th and September 12th, and council approved those. So that is now our new ordinance. It's in its 30 days before it takes effect right now. And in the part of their direction um, to staff, they uh, asked and directed staff to take to the Planning Commission for review and recommendation, a review of the additional uh, red line changes that were proposed by the plaintiffs in the settlement agreement. And those are actually outlined in, in attachments three and four. Um, attachment four actually has a matrix that goes through each of the red line changes and staff's comments on those changes. And then second, secondly, council directed uh, the Planning Commission to review and recommend uh, and for it to come back to council at the December 10th meeting, uh, increasing the current citywide inclusionary rate, which just you know changed um, to 15%, to consider increasing that to 20%. And they want to have that discussed back at the December 10th meeting. So that's the actual what's before you this evening. Um, those two things are one and two above. I've added two additional things we're asking you to consider tonight related to those, and that's A and B, um, which is a consider an additional staff recommendation for changes consistent with state law, and Lee will go over that in a minute. And then additionally, uh, to recommend to the, the city council that once they do um, make a change to the existing ordinance, that they actually send it back to you for further consideration. As we're going through it, and it's just been very fast, and it's pretty complicated. If you've looked at our inclusion ordinance, and many of you I know have spent quite a bit of time with it, you know, different sections relate to other sections, and you're going back and forth, and you're trying to figure it out, and it's pretty confusing. And we think we we see a few inconsistencies in there. And then if if council changes the the uh, inclusionary percentage further, we want to go back and look at um, some of those numbers and make sure we don't have things that, that have fallen through the cracks. Uh, for example, um, we have sections where we have rounding of a 0.7. Um, and in certain terms, if we're changing it to 20%, that may not make sense anymore. And so we want to go back and look at all of those and then bring those back to you and have you consider those and make a recommendation to council. Okay, so going through each one, one by one of the actions before the evening, the first is to review the additional proposed amendments presented by the plaintiffs. And again, uh, this is attachment four. It looks like this in your packet. 
Um, those are the plaintiff proposed changes not included in the specified amendments. The specified amendments are the ones that I just went over a minute ago that council approved. So there are about 26 to 28 of these, depending on which version we were, we were looking at. And um, on the left-hand side, you see a summary of the change, the reference to the section. On the right side, you see the staff comment. Specifically, our recommendation is, and we have this in the staff report to you as well, is to take no further action on the additional proposed men amendments um, in the red line on the grounds that the changes would, would either violate state law and government code and or have a potential or real adverse impact on the city's affordable housing production. Um, part of this also relates to, th there are some um, interpretation of uh, why some of the changes are in um, the red line. We did ask for some clarification from the plaintiffs and through the plaintiff's attorney, and we didn't receive any feedback from them of why they wanted them. So we were trying to analyze and and uh, speculate on why they wanted some of the changes, but we really didn't have enough information. So we did our best estimate of the analysis of why we think they that what they were trying to get at. and. Um, and what some of the implications are would also create further inconsistencies within the text. So that is our recommendation related to those, but we're available to discuss any of those um, if you would like to go through those. Um, additionally, uh, as part of that, we, with the passage of AB 330, we do want to consider uh, additional staff recommendation for changes consistent with state law. And I think, Lee, you may want to talk to this for a minute or two. Sure. So <clears throat> I'll briefly highlight that. So um, under the California Government Code Section 66474.2 and then under the pending Government Code Section 65589.5, which uh, the latter is taking effect on January 1st of 2020 as part of SB 330. That bill specifies that if a preliminary review application with the information that's specified in um, SB 330 itself is submitted and is a, a complete application, then that sets the clock for um, the laws and rules that the city can apply to a development project moving forward, assuming certain provisions are met. You know, the, the, the formal application has to be submitted within six months, for example. But um, the law actually precludes us from um, having new rules apply after that if the applicant is meeting those uh, those specified timelines. And so we wanted to call that out here so that it's clear. Um, I, I did get some correspondence from Commissioner Schifrin um, in advance of this discussion about um, whether or not we should call out the specific subsection um, in government code section 665, excuse me, 65589.5. It's actually um, subsection. Oh, I think. Yeah, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so um, that's the text. And then um, it is uh, subsection O, I believe, as uh, Commissioner Schifrin indicated. And so we do have the ability to reference that, um, particularly because we also say, um, or any other applicable state codes, um, arguably one could apply other sections of 65589.5 to uh, this criteria. Um, however, because we've got that uh, called out or any other applicable state codes, if it pleases the commission, we're happy to call out subsection O in, in this section. Um, but we do believe this is important to clarify um, that um, it's not just up to the city. <laughs> there are some state codes that apply and calling that out points people to um, some resources that they may want to reference when considering um, what, uh, what rules will apply and the timing of those. The, the last part there is just to clarify that um, it would be rules that are um, more recently approved by the council. If, if these other sections don't apply, we wouldn't just make up rules that um, would be used. It would be rules that um, are adopted as part of an inclusionary ordinance or implementing resolution. And that actually um, 
you know, we were we were trying to figure out the intent of the plaintiffs in their um, concerns. And so uh, we thought that might address the, the concerns that they have to clarify that, yes, it's, it's actually a more recent ordinance or resolution that has been adopted by the council that we may use. And I would add to that, in addition, there's just each year there have been increasingly more and more um, regulations and, and state codes and laws that are applicable to affordable housing. And so we wanted to just have some language that allowed us to update those as, as new laws came into effect. Right. Having the other applicable state codes precludes us from needing to necessarily uh, adjust our ordinance and um, having just the 65589.5, we initially had that in and of itself because we figure as it has been over the last two years been amended, it will continue to be amended, but we're clear either way. So if the commission desires to add subsection O, we're happy to make that recommendation to council as well. Um, additionally, um, we are recommending that the Planning Commission consider additional staff recommendation, which I mentioned earlier, um, for future planning consideration um, of any cleanup minimums following any council decision that's made um, on December 10th. Um, at that time, we may, you know, if we bring that back to you, there may be other, other parts of the inclusionary ordinance that you may want to recommend be changed as well. And then, um, B is part of that, as I already mentioned, just addresses some of the inconsistencies. And then finally, and I think the, the, the <coughs> part of the big discussion tonight is uh, number two, which is review and make recommendation um, for the city council regarding increasing this current citywide inclusionary rate from 15% to 20% prior to the December 10th council meeting. And our recommendation, which also is in the staff report, is to consider an increase in inclusionary percentage citywide for all housing developments, rental and ownership, only after a feasibility analysis is prepared by a qualified consultant evaluating the impacts of such changes. And I'm going to specifically just go into a little bit of why we're recommending that. Um, I, we believe that an informed decision based on credible analysis and market data is important. This is an area that does widely vary. There are, uh, you know, I think it's 11% across the country have inclusionary ordinances. When you look at some recent studies of inclusionary ordinances statewide, they vary widely. Um, it's really hard to compare apples for apples. So a 20% in one area is not necessarily the same as a 20%, both for market conditions, but also because they're often set at different area median incomes. Um, they have a breakdown. I'll go through a few of those in detail. Um, and then markets are different. Um, there could be, um, we really want to avoid unintended consequences of neg negatively impacting affordable housing production by making a decision without having it based um, on, on analysis and looking specifically at Santa Cruz. Um, and then finally, most, our most recent study was prepared by Kaiser Marston KMA for rental housing, um, and it was for rental housing only. We didn't actually have an analysis done for ownership housing. When we took this to council, we did say that in 2020 that we would come back um, and do an analysis, and then the lawsuit happened and every, everything, everything stopped. Um, but we don't actually have a recent analysis for ownership housing. We think that the market can bear actually a higher percentage for ownership, but we just don't have that information. So we just feel like we should, we should do that before we go forward. Um, just as a comparison of nearby jurisdictions, this is just um, four, because as I said, there's 60 and each one has so many nuances. Um, so this is just a quick look at these. Um, and what I will point out, um, and we can follow up if you're interested in any of this, obviously give you a copy of the, of the slides and give you some of the backup for this. It varies widely by jurisdiction, even, even cities and counties around us. So ranging, and these are ones specifically called out because they had at least a component of their ordinance that was at 20%. So we thought it was important to show you what that variation looks like. Um, and then Santa Cruz is a third down, so you can, you can compare that. Um, they include both a variety of compliance options, a variety of set-asides, a variety of, of threshold sides. Some are the same between rental and ownership, and some are different. 
Um, so it really does vary. I want to point out specifically as you look at the rental development, um, because this, this really impacts the feasibility of a project to be able to build it from a, develop, a development side and being able to finance it, is that percentage that I've circled in yellow of the area median income. So when you look at Monterey County, they have a 20% set aside, and we'll go into the details of what theirs looks like. But look at that range. It's from 50% up to 120%. San Francisco, um, their threshold project size is, is units of 10 or more. So they don't have anything under, under 10 units. Ours is five or more. There's impacts there. It's more expensive to finance the smaller projects than the larger ones. And their percentage of AMI, it, it starts lower than ours as a requirement, as a base requirement, but it goes up to 130% of AMI. Um, you can see Santa Cruz on the next. Santa Cruz also has, unlike Monterey and Watsonville, we actually have, if you try to create or if you want to create units off-site, meaning not in your project, um, you actually have to provide 30% more inclusionary units on the alternative site. So that, you know, we do have 15% now across the board, but we do have circumstances that they don't provide them in the project. They have to provide 30% more. Many ordinances don't have that. Um, ours is at 80%. There's no range right now. It's completely 80% um, for rental. When you get into ownership, it does go up to 120%. Watsonville's 15 to 20% does go up to 80 to 100% of AMI. When I just wanted to show this for a second. Many of you have also seen this. This has come before you, I think, in the last year. This is our housing, housing element, our annual progress report. Specifically, I just wanted to call uh, attention to where our needs are. We've actually done well um, in the moderate and above moderate. I think we would all agree that in Santa Cruz and our housing crisis, we need so much more. Um, but we do have a need for the very low and the low units. Um, from 2019, you can see those years we haven't gotten, we, we haven't achieved those yet. Um, we do have an opportunity to meet our regional housing needs assessment goals, our RENA goals by that period. But we do need to focus and, and it is much more likely, and this is how we've in Santa Cruz and many other jurisdictions have created these low and very low units, have been through a public subsidy, have been through public assistance, funding from affordable housing trust funds, and through affordable housing projects with um, private and, and uh, nonprofit developers. So uh, it's important to, to have this context as well. You typically are not going to see a lot of private market rate development achieving these low and very low units. So I want to just keep that in context when we look at what we're trying to achieve when we change the inclusionary ordinance and what those other elements go into that. Um, looking uh, more closely, specifically just at Monterey, I have the um, parts of their 20% ordinance circled that relate most closely to Santa Cruz's, that's at 80% AMI or lower. So when you look at that 20%, you see that 8% of their 20% is for moderate area median income, so that exceeds what's allowed in Santa Cruz. When you go to San Francisco, um, and a lot of people have, have cited San Francisco as a reference, and they have different for unit sizes. So between 10 and 24 units, um, they allow rental at 12%, at 65% of AM, AMI. And um, when you get to 25 or larger, the larger projects, it goes up overall to 18% overall, but only 10% is at that lower AMI, and the remaining 4% at moderate, and another 4% at 90 to 130% of AMI. So again, I'm pointing these out just to show the wide variation between different jurisdictions. And so why I think it's really important that we look at what we're doing as we go forward and make these important decisions about, um, about our inclusionary ordinance. Again, this is Watsonville's. Um, one interesting thing to note on Watsonville's project um, yes, is right below that circle. You'll see they have 5% for Section 8 at 80 to 120% of area median income. It's important to note that these are not project-based based vouchers for Watsonville. This, these are based on uh, tenant vouchers, and you can't guarantee that, so you can't actually finance against that. So I'm really curious of how this is working in Watsonville and what they've been able to achieve or accomplish with that, whether or not they've been able to meet this. Okay, so considerations for increasing or modifying the city's inclusionary requirement. I think one of our first goals is to determine what are our goals for the city? What are we trying to achieve with our ordinance? Are, uh, we may be wanting to achieve many of these things, but there may be some of them that resonate more with the community and the city um, than others. Meeting our regional housing needs assessment goals, meeting our Measure O commitment. 
um, creating inclusionary requirements that can be feasibly achieved. So 20 or 25 percent sounds great, and I think it sounds great to many of us, uh, but it may not be feasible at our current percent percentage rate at 80 percent of AMI. So we may want to consider that if we want to increase our overall inclusionary rate, that we may want to consider it at different affordability levels in order to make that actually feasible to support that development being built. So I think one of our goals should be to create inclusionary requirements that incentivize affordable housing development and also to create requirements that don't inhibit housing development overall. Uh, different requirements for small projects, under 25, under 10, these are, could be considerations that, that we look at. Um, then larger projects to really encourage those, that small project viability and affordable housing creation could be something else that we look at as far as modifying or increasing our inclusionary requirement. I think it's also good to do a deeper dive on what some of the other jurisdictions um, are doing um, and actually see what's working for them. Many of them have made changes within the last couple of years to their inclusionary ordinances. And um, we haven't had an opportunity. We have looked at and have seen some recent examples of, as I mentioned, about 60 cities, but we don't have a lot of detailed information on them and we don't have the information on how well they're working. And then uh, the last two things that we would recommend is to conduct a market and feasibility analysis for Santa Cruz for rental and ownership. As I mentioned, we don't have it yet for ownership inclusionary and determine options for consideration that we would bring forward to both the Planning Commission um, and to the City Council. And so if the direction really is one of the goals to have the maximum or the highest inclusionary rate, if it's 20 percent at AMI or to look at, well, maybe it's 20 percent at 120 percent of AMI, or maybe the goal is to get at that deeper affordability. So maybe it's 10 percent at 50 percent of AMI, or you could do a combination, 20 percent at different affordability levels, 10 percent very low, 5 percent at low, 5 percent at moderate. And I think the point is there's a lot of different ways to get at what our goals might be for the community. And I think we need to look at what the community really needs and balance those when we come forward, rather than just saying, well, let's go for a 20, 20 or 25 percent and not actually actually change the AMI or look at that. I think ultimately we're wanting to develop a new inclusionary requirement that's reflective of those community needs. So just to recap the recommendation and then we can go back over any of these um, is to consider an increase in the and the inclusionary percentage citywide after a feasibility analysis prepared by a qualified consultant to evaluate the impacts of these changes, to recommend specific changes reflect reflective of newly enacted state law. Um, recommend that council direct staff to review and bring any cleanup amendments related to identified inconsistencies created by ordinance amendments back to the Planning Commission. And then finally, recommend that council take no further action on the additional proposed red line amendments um, referenced in the plaintiff proposed changes that's uh, attachments three and four in your packet. And that concludes my presentation and um, we're happy to go through any of these in, in more detail. Thank you. Before we go to public comment, do staff, do uh, commissioners have questions for clarification of staff? Just one clarification. I, you went it over very quickly, but I, I thought I heard at one point you said that the council just went back to 15%. I think it's important to clarify that the council only went back to 15% for rental housing outside of the downtown for ownership units and for rental housing downtown. It's always been 15 been 15% since 1970, 1980. Thank you for clarifying. That's right. Any questions? Uh, Commissioner Nielsen. Um, well, I guess I have a random question first, but is it normal that plaintiffs propose changes to ordinances? Um, we haven't had, uh, in my experience, I've never actually had an experience where we had anything like this of, of, a, of, a, of a nature and then didn't actually have a follow-up conversation with why, the, why they wanted the changes or really having, a, having an understanding. So uh, the main changes that were in the settlement agreement were one that we did have quite a bit of discussion over of those were the issues that the plaintiffs felt really strongly about and were the basis of the lawsuit. The other ones, there just wasn't an explanation for those. Okay. I, I was just was curious. It, it, I hadn't heard of it before, so I was just curious about it. Um, in terms of the, uh, with the uh, examples you gave of other communities, um, and I've seen it also in kind of doing my research, that there are, there are ways, I mean, you could set up these mixes of, 
of different, like where you could do very low, low, um, and moderate in different percentages. Um, in the research that you've done and or what you know about that, is it, are they set percentages? Like, does it have to be, or, or has, not that it has to be, but has it been that it's 8%, 8%, and, you know, 5% of like 8% very low, 8% low, 5% moderate, or whatever it might be? Is it set, or is, or can, can the developer um, mix and match and, and kind of create a, their own options within that? That's a detailed question. Um, there, there are some that if a developer has some choices, if they want to go very low, I've seen one or two like that. Most of them, when we're doing these comparison of these analysis, have laid out um, the combination of, as you said, like an 8% or a 5%. Um, but they include some language in their ordinance, and we have some of this as well, that if a developer wants to provide deeper affordability, that council can consider modifying the inclusionary requirements to accommodate that if they're willing to provide more affordability in the project. And then some have a preference for going lower to try to get at the, at the very low or extremely low income. Are there incentives for that? Some in? do. Yeah, and we actually have in our ordinance that for projects that are 40% more, they're willing to provide 40% of affordable housing that the city can actually, um, even that if it's a market rate project, but with a 40% affordability, that the city can put money in the project as an incentive to reach that. Okay. And depending on um, the levels of affordability and the percentages that they're proposing, they may also be able to take advantage of the state density bonus. So mm -hmm. at 11%, at very low, You've seen some projects come forward where that's been proposed. Most recently, the, the 190 Westcliff project proposed 11% at very low, which offered them the 35% uh, state density bonus. Okay. And uh, currently right now, we um, just since you brought state density, currently right now, the 35% is the, is the maximum bonus that's allowed in the city? As of today, yes. Um, as of January 1st of 2020, there is a bill, um, and I will pull that bill number up while I'm telling you about it. Um, that will allow for 100% affordable projects to have an 80% density bonus, and if they're within a half mile of a major transit stop, to have no density limitation and also to um, add uh, 33 feet and uh, three stories to whatever is otherwise authorized and provide no parking um, with uh, uh, those for those projects that are within that are 100% affordable and within a half mile of a major transit stop. That's pending. That is going to be law effective uh, January 1st as of uh, January 1st, 2020. And the, um, the law is AB 1763. Thank you. Anything Welcome. else for us before we go to public comment? Just a couple of quick things. Commissioner Stallman? Yeah, one question. So you started out our attachment number one, the whole settlement stuff off the table tonight, as well as the, the next section after that with the, the red line marks? The actual attachments, if you look on the staff report, it lists that attachment two is a red line. It's actually the one that got in your packet is clean, so and it's not labeled attachment two, so we apologize for that. That's one of the things that makes it really confusing. Attachment three is the red line of the plaintiff's proposed changes beyond the settlement agreement. And then attachment four is the matrix that goes through one by one each of the proposed red line changes by the plaintiffs with staff comments. Okay, got it. Thank you. Other questions, clarifying questions for staff before we go to public comment? So this is a public hearing. Uh, we'll open public comment now. Um, you're not required to give your name, but we invite you to do so. Please line up on the your right side of the room and sign in if you would, and then address the commission. Um, we will be making a decision, uh, hopefully we'll be making a decision tonight based on the staff recommendation and your input, so um, each speaker will be granted two minutes and welcome. Hello. Good evening. 
Commissioner and um, Commissioner members, <laughs> council members. Um, I'm Kate Roberts, the President and CEO of Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. And we did submit a letter in, um, w in reference to what I'm going to talk about. It should be in your packet. Um, so I just wanted to emphasize a, a few of those points and go on record here tonight to um, state our position on this, which is that we would like to strongly encourage the planning commissioners to not change course by referring to the inclusionary housing ordinance for amendments at this time. I just wanted to echo a lot of the fine work that staff has uh, just recently uh, done and presented tonight for a lot of reasons they've talked about, uh, such as recent studies have demonstrated that highly restrictive inclusionary housing policies may result in less housing being built and the diminished affordability of those units that do get built. We're obviously needing a lot more housing in our community, so anything that could put that at risk is something that we are, would like to avoid. Um, and just that there was a lot of input from community members and stakeholders that went into the current draft of the inclusionary ordinance. So. Uh, should changes or amendments be considered, I think uh, the the wise course of action would be to have a more robust community engagement process around ch those changes should they should they happen. So, and just to echo again what staff was saying about doing feasibility analysis, um, I think that's going to be really important before a decision is made to decide on what types of changes should be made. Um, and I just want to encourage you in the last few seconds I have to think about other realistic policy solutions that can encourage more housing opportunities. Those are referenced in our 2018 MBEP um, housing white paper that really outlines several additional ways that you all could increase more housing, such as reduced parking requirements, adopting a dense, uh, enhanced density bonus ordinances, et cetera. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for your uh, service and really appreciate your time and energy into this important issue. Thank you for your comments. Welcome. Good evening, Jane Barr with Eden Housing. I support the staff recommendations, but don't support an increase from the current 15%. Um, it's been tried and failed with other jurisdictions, and I think when you have your consultant look at what jurisdictions, what percentages they have now, you won't see very many at 20%. Um, I think it's a good idea to check with the other jurisdictions, have your feasibility analysis, but I think essentially you already did that when you came up with your percentages six months ago or whenever it was, so you, I, th I think you're kind of doing the same work. Um, the arena, uh, when you look at the arena, the hardest to meet are the very low and low. Um, it's much easier or, or to meet the mod and above mod, and generally uh, jurisdictions will meet above mod and, and generally meet the mod. So. I hope you keep that in mind. And finally, I, I just don't think we can afford to scare away developers. Uh, the return will be affected by the greater affordability re requirements, and the developers um, have other choices in other markets. Um, and the concern is that how this will affect increasing the supply of housing in Santa Cruz County. We need both market rate and affordable. We're way behind in supply, so I hope you keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Gail Jack, and I'm with Affordable Housing Now. We submitted a letter, and I hope you've all had a chance to read that. But I, uh, again, want to uh, emphasize some of our points. And one of them was a, a study that we cited that was done in Portland in 2017. And they increased their ordinance, uh, their inclusionary ordinance ordinance percentage to 20%. And they found in their situation that it really put a damper on, on what was built. They had the five years previous to this change, they were building around 3,000 units a year. After this went into um, effect, it dropped to about 700 units a year. Now, I'm not saying we're Portland. We're obviously not Portland, but just something to consider. We are um, in agreement to not increase to 20% for fear of putting a damper on building. And there are other ways to incentivize housing that a lot of people have talked about tonight, including what a study from UC Berkeley found uh, would be a couple things. Reduce parking was one. Reduce the percentage of retail space and also cut in about a third, 33% off the time it takes 
to get a permit to develop. They found those three factors really boosted not only the development, but also the equity of what those projects look like. So I hope you consider this all carefully before your decision. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. <coughs> Welcome. Uh, good evening, Chair Pepin and uh, Planning Commissioners. My name is Jesse Bristow, Swenson Builders. I'm a development project manager and here in Santa Cruz. And I think staff did a great job of really uh, emphasizing the um, variables that affect affordable housing and market rate uh, development. We, we did submit a letter. I do hope you read it. And I just want to reiterate those points as well. Just on the grand scheme of things, 2018, uh, California State, we built 80,000 units to keep up with the economic growth of you know the fifth largest economy. We needed 180,000 units. And for the Bay Area, for every seven jobs that are created, one unit is being built. So it really highlights the demand, and it certainly gets pushed onto our community um, over the hill. And we're certainly impacted by that with construction costs. This past year, we've seen a 20% increase in construction. So there's certain factors that really um, can take effect on, on a proposed development. But in the grand scheme of things, as that increase in affordability, we, ha we have no issue um, with the 15% re requirement. We think inclusionary should be part of developments, but as you start to make that increase, it starts to chip away at the financial feasibility of that project because those market rate units are subsidizing those affordable units, and then those have to go up to make up for that rent roll because we go to a lender, we go to a bank, and they need their guaranteed return on that lend of, of what is being built. So I just really want to emphasize that um, if, as, we, as we push that up, you're, you're squeezing um, the feasibility of it out. And again, you, you will, we won't get any more proposals. And maybe that's the underlying uh, tone of, of this purpose is, is not to have development. Um, so as it stands, we feel that you know 15% overall, you have to take a look, 15% of something is better than 20% of nothing. So um, we hope you take that into consideration. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker, welcome. Good evening, my name is Henry Hooker. I'm an architect, retired, lived in Santa Cruz for 30 years. I am deeply concerned about the housing crisis in Santa Cruz. I think that looking at uh, the housing that's been built in the last 20 years, we can't really say that the current policy is working um, for anybody. Uh, subsidized or not, and um, the idea of making it, of somehow or other jiggering that so that there's less incentive for builders to build here um, or increasing the cost for the people who are trying to buy market rate <coughs> houses or homes in projects that are providing the uh, inclusionary uh, units, uh, it's just, Ultimately, I, I worry that it doesn't make sense. So I applaud the notion that you would study this very carefully to see whether or not uh, we are going to get more housing, ultimately, for people who, are, uh, who can't afford housing currently, but also for people who may be able to. Uh, that Santa Cruz really needs to step up to the plate and uh, provide enough homes for the people who work here. Um, there are not nearly enough for the people, uh, and <clears throat> what this is doing is causing uh, environmental degradation by forcing people to commute into town, um, and something that in the long term uh, will make the city a better city, more responsible city, a more diverse city, improve the quality of life by having pedestrian and uh, bike things going on in the city uh, that are sustainable. Uh, so what we're looking for is sustainable growth, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Welcome. Hi, John Swift. And I would just like to encourage you to think about incentivizing housing development and affordable housing development rather than disincentivizing. The density bonus law is working. I involved in a number of projects we are trying to generate low and very low income units. You've seen some recent projects, I think, on Westcliff Drive. The density bonus generated, I think, five or six very low income units. 
Um, you know, requiring increasing the number of affordable units, like uh, Jesse was saying, just increases the burden on the market rate units. This increases the price that's got to be charged in rent or for sale of those 80% or 85% or whatever is left of market rate units. And this has a cyclical effect. I mean, it, 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 it compounds. Um, the median price goes up. The median income goes up. The, the cost of the affordable unit goes up. It's all in a, it's uh, uh, going in the wrong direction. We're pushing the price up and the affordable requirements go up. Um, again, we really have to think about incentivizing the development of low income housing as opposed to disincentivizing. Um, really, that's the main point I'm trying to make. Um, I really think we do need to study this as an extremely complicated law, uh, ordinance. When we try to do these housing projects, figuring out the economics of these projects and taking into account the affordable ordinance, it's very complex. And I hope you make the decision with good analysis, good market-based and very localized analysis, not generalized analysis. <clears throat> so thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker, welcome. Welcome, Chair Pepping. Fellow commissioners, my name is Mark Masidi Miller, and uh, less than a year ago, I was sitting on the other side of that dais uh, with you guys. Um, but I wanted to come tonight because I was part of the subcommittee of the Planning Commission that studied the inclusionary zoning ordinance and the amendments to it that were enacted not all that long ago. And uh, so I'm here tonight to tell you that I think the staff recommendation is solid. Uh, the staff has changed a little bit since then, but I, the point is that this needs careful study. And while I'm all for affordable housing and have worked as a housing advocate for many years, uh, currently uh, with uh, the Communities Organized for Relational Power and Action, a group of over 30 nonprofit institutions in the Tri-County area where all I think about is housing. Uh, I want more housing, particularly affordable housing. Um, but we have to be careful that we're building housing. The most important thing is to keep building housing because the need is so great. And uh, so I would encourage you to just adopt the staff recommendation and uh, uh, advise your city council to be cautious and uh, thorough and uh, careful with this one. Um, thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you for your comments. Seeing, seeing no other speakers, we will close the public comment section of the <clears throat> of the public hearing and bring it back to the commission for discussion. And Commissioner Conway, I see your hand first. You want to lead it off? Oh, thank you. Um, and thank you, staff. Um, and thank you to everyone who came out tonight to follow this complicated item and share your thoughts with the commission about these policy changes. We all love Santa Cruz and are deeply affected by the housing crisis and it's fair to say we're here to try to address the problem. We're presented with a decision in the form of a staff recommendation, and I'm gonna structure my comments according to that recommendation. First of all, we're asked to consider an increase in percentage only after financial analysis. The premise of an inclusionary housing ordinance is to require private developers to contribute to a community need by providing affordable units in exchange for the right to build housing. As with any fee or exaction, a jurisdiction must be able to prove nexus and proportionality for the requirement. In other words, the city has to show that there's a need for the affordable housing and that the requirement is reasonable. For the sake of the community, it must be a requirement that allows for creation of the housing that we so desperately need. The citywide requirement has been set at 15% through a settlement agreement. As the staff report indicates, Circumstances have changed. There may be an argument for increasing the percentage to 20%, but there must be an economic analysis to demonstrate whether or not it meets that test. An economic analysis will support an appropriate number of affordable units and an appropriate level of income targeting. Without a credible economic analysis, the city is vulnerable because it has not met the nexus and proportionality requirement. Inclusionary ordinances work when they are thoughtful, reasonable, and stable. 
So the cost of providing the affordable units become baked into the development assumptions. Inclusionary ordinances are the object lesson for the importance of stable public policy that must be changed slowly, thoughtfully, and seldom. That is, if the intention is to create affordable units. <coughs> Finally, our policies must not disincentivize building housing and an affordable housing requirement that is too onerous will lead to no housing at all. Number two, uh, make specified changes to newly enacted state law. Taking advantage of this opportunity wherein the city is amending its inclusionary housing ordinance to incorporate new st state law, it makes sense. This recommendation makes the state language explicit in our ordinance that's in effect whether or not we act on it. So adding it will avoid potential confusion. Number three, review and bring cleanup amendments related to identified inconsistencies. The council has directed staff to bring the inclusionary ordinance back to the planning commission at a future date for cleanup language in the event there are inconsistencies or unintended consequences. Uh, I'm not positive this requires action tonight, but I agree with council and with staff that in case it doesn't go without saying, future proposed changes should be brought back to the planning commission for consideration. I have an additional comment on the future work of this ordinance. I'd like to suggest uh, that the council consider again in the future a deeper review and possible restructuring of this inclusionary housing ordinance. In the 40 years since Measure O passed, this ordinance that implements the referendum has been modified many times, always in the spirit of addressing the intent of the voters. This has given us at this time an ordinance that is exceedingly complex and difficult to follow. And I'm saying this as someone who reads these policies for a living. This is a problem for the builders who are trying to create housing and the complexity of the ordinance makes it very hard for community members to see that we are asking for fair participation in affordable housing from people who are creating housing in Santa Cruz. Again, this is a comment for future consideration and please not intended to land another task on the department's to-do list at this time. As a longer term project though, this might be worth consideration. Four, make no further amendments related to the plaintiff's proposed changes. And thank you staff for the helpful analysis of the additional uh, recommended changes outside of the settlement agreement. The effect of these additional recommendations would be to make it more difficult to build housing. Especially disturbing are the obstacles they would impose on small projects, which are the parcels that represent much of our potential new housing. There just are not that many larger parcels left to develop. I look forward to a robust discussion amongst the commission this evening. Um, and with that, I would like to move the staff recommendation. I'll second. Okay, so we have a, uh, a motion and a second. So all the discussion will be of the motion. Are there commissioners? Mr. Schifrin? Well, let me start out by uh, following up with something staff said, which is uh, look at what we need to do is look at what the community really needs. And I would argue that this community is suffering from a very severe affordable housing crisis. Um, the statistics that are included in what I sent, Santa Cruz is one of the least affordable communities in the state and the nation. We rank 200 and, uh, in a ranking of 291 cities. We were found to be the least affordable in America for cities. We've got home. For teachers. For teachers, I'm sorry. For teachers, um, we have a very, very serious homeless, pro homeless problem. Um, and I could go on and on. The, the, we have an affordable housing crisis and something and I think this city needs to do more to try to respond to respond to that. I don't disagree with the notion of modifying, refining an, uh, the inclusionary approach mm -hmm. to make it more workable. 
um, to the extent that it that it can, that it still retains its basic thrust of providing more affordable housing. But realistically, in my mind, that's never going to come if we put everything off to economic studies and uh, more community outreach. To me, they're they're not very. Th that will not lead to ultimately getting more affordable housing. We've had a year's discussion of uh, the need for affordable housing and what, what the council ended up doing at that time was reducing the affordability requirement from 15% to 10% uh, outside of the downtown area. So my sense is I don't have a lot of confidence in economic studies. They tend to, um, to, they tend to show what the consultants and the staff and developers want. There are so many variables that go into whether a housing project is feasible or not. Um, I, and in a market like as, our, as ours, as staff says, rents go up, prices go down a little, housing prices, it's, there's a lot of variation. When Measure O passed, and it was an initiative, not a referendum, the Measure J was a referendum, um, the, it included a 15% affordability requirement. There was no study that was done. And in, those, uh, and in the early meetings with developers, it was similar to what we heard tonight. You're going to make housing impossible. It's not going to happen. Uh, don't do 15% uh, because it's not going to work. Well, it worked, I think. Uh, it might not have provided as much housing as other people would like. But I don't think that's a, ultimately a problem of the inclusionary requirement. When there wasn't an inclusionary requirement for rental housing in the city, we didn't get rental housing market rate projects because the tax laws made it infeasible. The fact of the matter is things have changed in Santa Cruz. Oh, I wanted to say one thing about comparisons. It was interesting. It's sort of comparisons are all odious, but let me give you a comparison of all these other cities. Well, we are in a very uh, special and uh, we're not unique, maybe, but we have a real specific difficult problem. We're adjacent to Silicon Valley, where the housing prices are even worse. We have a university that's growing and, uh, and, and, and impacting our housing demand. And so the need for housing uh, is, is great, and it has been for decades. And what, what's really changing now is we have state laws that are re not only requiring the city to not be able to reduce density for a project once it comes in, but even not being able to deny a project once it comes in if it meets the basic requirements. Uh, and on top of that, there's a density bonus allowance that allows the density to go up by 35%. Um, in addition, the city, with the recent general plan, with the downtown recovery plan has increased density significantly in the downtown area and other areas of the city. In my view, more density makes, um, you know, it, it makes for uh, an economy of scale for um, providing additional inclusionary low, lower income units. The other thing that I think is important to mention is that there are incentives now that can assist developers of market rate housing in providing their inclusionary units. Um, the, those in, the, the main incentive is what's called project-based vouchers, where um, a developer of a, uh, of a market rate project can get a, essentially a Section 8 voucher. So while the tenant will pay 25% of their income for housing, the, the, the developer or the owner will receive a fair market rent. The fair market rent might not be exactly the same as a market rate, but it's very, it's not, it's, it's fairly close. In talking to the, the developer of the Water Street project that just opened, uh, those, that, those project based vouchers made that project work uh, financially. My sense is that if we're going to, to respond meaningfully to the affordable housing crisis that is severe in Santa Cruz, we need to increase the inclusionary requirement. Once that requirement is increased, then I think staff will have a, a great incentive, the development community will have a great incentive to come and immediately try to work to make that more feasible for them. If we don't increase the inclusionary requirement, all we're going to do is put off in time and only hear why it won't work. I think we, should, we need to make it work. So on that basis, I would make a motion to amend the motion on the floor um, to 
do two things. The main thing is to recommend to the city council that they increase the inclusionary requirement for, uh, for um, rental and ownership units to 20%. And um, there's a, uh, in the correspondence that I, said, I submitted, there's the ordinance that would do that. So my, why don't I just start with that, just make the motion that the um, amend the motion on the floor to increase the inclusionary requirement to 20 percent. I second that. Discussion of the motion to amend. Um, yeah. Sure, Greenberg. Uh, yeah. So, um, well, I appreciate a lot of, of the work of the staff and the points that were made about the concern surrounding AMI and needs for a vision within the inclusionary, whether it's 15 or 20. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, that that is a conversation that needs to happen and should happen. Um, I think that uh, given the fact that state laws are changing, that densities, unlike in the early 80s, um, you know, when the original measure was passed, um, are going to be significantly higher in the downtown, potentially, hopefully, beyond the downtown as well, um, given the return to the corridor planning, and then given the, you know, the, the new state laws that override any effort to deny the potential for density insofar as it meets the, the general plan, we are about to embark on potentially, you know, a lot of increased development on a scale that is, I think, as Commissioner Schifrin was saying, an economy of scale um, that can make it feasible to have more inclusionary and, uh, you know, but on the other side, if we don't have inclusionary, can create an imbalance on a larger scale between, let's say, 85 percent to 15 percent of unaffordable to affordable housing, um, that could also have its own effect. So I'd like to consider also the effect of larger and larger amounts of what is essentially not moderate but unaffordable housing to the majority of people that live in Santa Cruz on gentrification and displacement. Um, and the areas, I don't know if people are familiar, for instance, with the urban displacement project at UC Berkeley, uh, but they've done mapping of areas throughout the Bay Area, um, as well as in Southern California and other parts of the, the West, and um, they're starting to do projects around the country, looking at risk of uh, displacement. Uh, and that is often associated with areas that are hot mark in hot market cities, where there hasn't been as much development, where d development is imminent, where laws are changing to allow for increased development, alongside areas that <clears throat> are what they're calling exclusionary, which are already overpriced. And our downtown area is at very high risk of displacement right now. And so we have to consider not only the concerns of developers, but also the concerns of the majority of people living here uh, currently, as well as people who are not able to afford to live here but are working here, um, including teachers and public sector workers and others, uh, in terms of, you know, creating an exclusionary market via a, a much larger proportion given the density um, of unaffordable housing. So that's, that's one concern. Another concern I have, and that I would just make in relation to feasibility studies. So I think feasibility studies obviously are much more commonly done now than they were, I guess they were not done really <laughs> in the early days of inclusionary ordinances. Um, and so I've been trying to read up on feasibility studies and I found this um, new report as of um, November 2018 um, produced by the Turner Center for Housing Innovation at Berkeley, Grounded Solutions Network, uh, Lincoln Institute of Land Policy called Strengthening Inclusionary Housing Feasibility Studies. And I can share that with the commission. Um, and this is just the executive summary, but you know, it's a it's a um, group of folks that came together um, <clears throat> that included um, you know people in housing economics, people in uh, you know with expertise, uh, eight consultants with extensive professional experience producing these studies, um, uh, people in you know who are housing managers, people who are in economic development, and so forth. Um, coming together and reflecting on, I think, one of the things that um, 
uh, Bonnie Lipscomb mentioned, which is just the wide variety um, of both inclusionary ordinances as well as feasibility studies, and came to the conclusion that there's really um, kind of no best practices right now um, regarding feasibility studies, um, and that there's a wide array of metrics and measures that are used, and that much of this depends on sort of, you know, who comes together around what kinds of priorities um, for these studies. Um, and I wanted to just read one piece, and I'm going to try to speak as quickly as I can because I don't mean to take so much time. Um, but uh, a point of agreement was that more effort should be directed to helping policymakers and the general public understand the limitations of these studies and their inherent imprecision. Sometimes cities want to treat the results of feasibility studies like appraisal results, but this may be the result of a misunderstanding of these studies' role and limitations. Limited data and the inherent diversity in the economics of different development projects mean that feasibility studies which only examine a small number of project prototypes will never be as objective and definitive as policymakers may want them to be. Instead of providing a definitive answer to what is feasible in all cases, participants stressed that feasibility studies should be seen as providing a reality check and a way to illustrate the potential impact of proposed policy changes. Similarly, feasibility studies do not provide the single correct policy answer. In fact, successfully, uh, successful adopted policies do not always exactly mirror the results of the feasibility study. Participants seem to agree, and this is, I think, a, a really important point, uh, that a wider understanding of these limitations could lead to, a, to more humility in the policy design process. Because all of the important economic feasibility questions cannot be answered definitively, and because economic feasibility studies examine a single point in time and cannot accurately project how market changes will affect development feasibility, policies should build in periodic assessment and opportunities for program refinement. So I guess I would say, <laughs> in sum, that uh, if we go with a feasibility study, and there are some best practice, there, you know, these, these folks came together to argue for certain kinds of considerations that should um, be brought to bear on how it's structured. One key point being transparency and replicability, um, and another being the ability to return and revise um, the, the, you know, the conclusions of the feasibility study periodically, annually, uh, every two years, and so forth. Um, but in addition, um, if we don't go with the feasibility study, that we can still return periodically, annually, or every two years, to thinking about how is this working. And I think actually that would be really a healthy thing to, to have as a practice, is to look at what are the impacts of this. You know, we can anticipate under all kinds of different circumstances um, on, you know, on the eve of what are about to be these state laws that are going to really change the environment considerably. Um, and it's going to be quite difficult, whereas we can take this kind of, I think, really important step forward saying this is a value of our community. This is something that we, you know, that we hold, you know, as something that is a main goal motivating a lot of the work that we're doing on this commission and in the city right now, which is to address this crisis. Um, and uh, we can do so thoughtfully uh, and collectively while continually continuing to revisit this policy, um, knowing that feasibility studies themselves um, are imprecise and, and, and complex in all kinds of ways as well. So, um, you know, so that's something that I that I would like to um, to add to that to that amendment, um, and I think I'll leave it there for now. Could I just say that the uh, the proposed uh, ordinance change is up. Um, Bonnie just told me it's up on the, it's out there so that everybody can see what that, the proposed amendment to the amendment on the floor is to adopt the, to recommend that ordinance change. Um, Commissioner Greenberg, I'm not sure if I understood. Were you um, suggesting a change to the motion to amend? Well, I think that. I mean, it, I was thinking that it could be even a separate, um, you know, amendment or motion, I suppose, which is that if we do go with the feasibility study, I could propose another. I, I'm supporting this amendment that we not do the, um, the study. On the other hand, <clears throat> in the event, maybe I should wait Let's for the not, vote on this. Yeah, okay. maybe hold the hypothetical. Yeah. yeah, we'll have a, there'll be an outcome that'll potentially yeah. enable you to act yeah. on that. Commissioner Nielsen. And we're and we're on again just to clarify procedurally we're on the we're on discussion prior to a vote of 
not the original motion from Commissioner Conway, but of Commissioner Schifrin's motion to amend. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think all of us up here sitting can uh, can agree that um, that more affordable housing is needed in this city. That's there. There's no argument there. I think it's just a matter of how we're going to get there. Um, and I and I don't think we're gonna I don't think we're gonna meet it by um, um, by creating haphazard um, you know policy or or. or um, uh, revising, you know, our current policy, um, and so any any changes that that want to be considered or that we want to consider, I think, need to go through some, um, you know, a real study that is conducted and that's uh, that's rigorous. And I understand um, that you know the study is not may not hit may not hit the number exact or might it might not hit the mark exact, but it, at least with with having with taking it through that process and um, and having it be done in you know in a in a thoughtful way, I, I think it's going to get closer to um, what's needed for us in the city, um, rather than just choosing a number um, just randomly. It, um, so. Um, What I'll also say is that in the last in the last few years, we've been really um, trying to tackle and address um, the aff affordable housing um, crisis that we have in our in our city. We've been working on the inclusion the inclu inclusionary ordinance, which we're talking about right now. We we talked about density ordinance. Um, we've talked uh, uh, we talked about the ADU ordinance. We've talked about the downtown plan. Corridor plan, um, which unfortunately is on the back burner currently, um, but um, but all of these things um, need to work together. All these plans and policies and ordinances need to work together to create the platform for the for the affordable housing solution that um, that we need to have. Um, and I think that, and there needs to be an analysis of 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 all of that and how that all works together. And um, and and so I'm so I'm just basically continuing to get to the point that I think this that you know some sort of feasibility study is necessary um, if if changes are going to be made. I, I mean, par, part of me um, feels that um, as uh, as Mr. Swift said when he spoke, you know, the density. The density bonus is working, and there are developments that are happening. I mean, 190 Westcliff is an example of the of density bonus. That's the first um, project in this town that has used density bonus. Um, they've, uh, if I remember correctly, it's 10 affordable units, but eight of them are were very low, um, very low income, um, and which. If you looked at the RENA numbers, um, that's two thirds of what we've developed in the last uh, four years. So just right there in that one project, it's created um, a good amount com comparatively um, for those for that very low income. Um, so you know, I, I think as as we have it, we have a, you know the density bonus. Uh, Ordinance that we have, it it's as we have it written, it works, and it's and um, um, and then uh, in addition, in the last um, you know last couple of years, we amended or we've been working on the downtown plan. That's another that's another plan that we've been working with, trying to increase um, increase densities, and and thereby with increase of density, we are looking to create housing, and by creating housing, thereby we are also. Um, looking to create uh, more affordable housing, um, so you know I I think that you know what we have and what we've created and we've put we spent a lot of time up here talking about this and and creating these policies and these these ordinances and and reworking them and tailoring them that we need to give ourselves some time to see how it works. I mean, I don't think we need to rush into changing things um, um, 
beyond what we have right now. I think we need to kind of see how it actually works and and um, and then make adjustments, you know, as we as we see how it goes. Um, so, I mean, so that's my feeling about you know uh, about increasing um, our percentage. Um, I don't think we should be increasing it. Um, although, if um, if it does come down to that, um, or, or that's you know is you know something that's desired, then I think a study has to be um, has to be um, done for that to see if it's to see what's feasible. Um, in addition to that, if we're um, you know and if we're going to be looking at changes, um, I think we should be looking. I, I think we should open it up. I think we should be looking at additional changes that can happen. Um, you know, I'd like to consider um, w more ways to incentivize development um, and incentivize uh, affordable housing. Um, so one being enhanced density bonus. I think that's, um, that's something that uh, the city should be potentially looking at. I think um, Development fee reductions should be another thing that, that the city continues to look at. Fast track permitting is another one. I mean, we're talking about, you know, reducing costs for developers will help. Um, will help this. It's it's all it's all it all plays into it. So the the, the more we can reduce the cost, the more housing we can get. Um, reduce the parking requirements. Um, uh, I think unbundling the parking is another thing that needs to be looked at. Um, the, I mean, rent, rents alone can be reduced just by unbundling parking, like where, so the developer is not, you know, the, the, or the renter does not, is not required to be renting a parking space. Um, reduce development standards, um, you know, continuing to look at that. How can we, how can we continue to, um, reduce those standards to incentivize housing and incentivize affordable housing, um, and also ministerial approvals. Um, that again, it's uh, let, let's make this easier and um, let's make it cheaper so that it can happen. Um, those are my comments. Thank you, Vice Chair Spellman. Thank you. Yeah, I share uh, many of those comments. Uh, the commissioner just spoke of. I'm not in favor of an increase to 20%. I think as a community, we're, we're really struggling to find ways to make affordable housing in our community. And specifically the low and very low income level housing that's, you know, we're, we're lowfully uh, lacking in those areas. I would also encourage incentivizing those components. It sounds like the state's going to do our job for us if we don't start to address it ourselves and we're going to be in the same position of not being able to control it. Um, so I, I think we need to be very careful on, on how we do that. Just increasing from 15 to 20 percent I don't think is doing that. We're not essentially getting the units at 15 percent. I don't understand the logic that we're going to get them at, at 20 percent. Um, I think there were some thoughtful statements made tonight. I think a study is an imperative component to this and being smart about the type of study we're asking for is also another prudent uh, approach. Uh, some way of localizing what the analysis is and how we really fundamentally understand our community and what's really needed here. It's not about paying a consultant who's done 20 studies and tells us that we can afford 15% or 18%. Uh, it's more about what's reasonable in, in our community. Um, th this is an extremely complicated you know, section of our code. Having gone through it a year ago and now revisiting it uh, in light of you know, essentially a, a lawsuit that has, has sort of forced our hand here, it's, it's shown me how incredibly complex, you know, the issue is just, just as it's written. So I too would be supportive of a long-term 
approach to how do we make that a more manageable document so that all parties can uh, maneuver within that in a way that actually gets us the units that we so desperately desire. Um, yeah, other things are, you know, how can we focus our efforts on the things that we can actually control? Um, we operate in a, you know, in a development uh, climate here that is, you know, incredibly challenging, even to, for example, affordable housing developers. I've spoken at length with the, both the builder and developer uh, of the Water Street project, and, and you're right, without the vouchers, that project would never have happened. It also got a loan from the city for $4.7 million, which how many of those projects can we afford to give that kind of funding to? Um, there's also substantial tax credit equities that went into that that um, you know, would have been the third component of that scenario that would have made that project not pencil out. So it was that combination of creativity and ability <laughs> in, in that moment in time having funds available to support that project that we got the number of affordable units that we did. Um, but that is, you know, you, you, you take a step back and look at that and you see how incredibly difficult it is just to get to the table to get that project built uh, with people who have the best intentions for putting that type of housing in our community. Um, the other thing we can control too is, is our, our process, right? Our process and how we can streamline um, some of the components that are gonna deal specifically with affordable housing. Um, so that's some of the thoughts I had around, uh, my thoughts are to incentivize the low income as opposed to just wholeheartedly increasing the percentage. I think that's, I think that is the piece that does require further analysis and people that um, delve in those areas much more broadly than a commission who's, who's on this for you know, a finite period of time. So I would be in support of that and not in support of skipping that piece. Um. <clears throat> I don't think I need to um, repeat. I'm trying to think about what I can share that's not a, a repeat of what's been offered. Um, and we still have a main motion to um, get back to on discussion. So I think I might hold most of my comments on that and say that I'm, I'm that. I just clarify uh, one um, point that uh, made about the difficulty of building 100% low income projects because I thought. Could I, oh. could I actually, yes, and could I finish my comment? To I, you ha you agree. I was just worried you're going to start to say we're going to have to vote now, and I just would like to say a few words before we. Thank you. Um, that upset me, so I'm trying to, I lost my train of thought. Maybe I spoke too quietly, so you interrupted me. Don't remember what I was saying. So go ahead um, and share your your comments. And, and I just want to say that we don't, what we get to do is we get to um, um, persuade one another and then we have a vote. And that's all we get to do. So offer your last comment and then I will call well, for a vote. We also can get to discuss issues. I mean, it's not just, you know, everybody just says whatever they think and then we vote. Sometimes there can be some dialogue among commissioners that can be informative. So I, I think that's, there's nothing unusual about that. I mean, commissioners do have things to add to what other commissioners say. And I think that's happening. So, I mean, what I was going to try to clarify is that, one, I agree 100%. Doing affordable housing, 100% affordable projects is more difficult than doing market rate housing. Market rate housing is difficult to do, but tax credits, all the different funding sources that have to come together for an affordable project, 100% affordable project is very, very difficult. And those subsidies, those federal and state subsidies are generally only available for 100% projects. 
when I was referring to project-based vouchers, they are a form of subsidy that can be applied to a 15 percent or a 20 percent inclusionary project. They don't have to be 100 percent affordable because they can go and they can make that internal subsidy that is required for an inclusionary unit more feasible. And that was the only point I was trying to make. I totally agree with you about the uh, difficulty of doing 100 percent affordable low-income project. Mr. Conway? I'd like to call the question on the proposed amendment. Okay. Can I just add something? That so we've all spoken, and we have a main motion to get back to. I'm um, kind of counting the votes, and I don't think there's support for the motion to amend, so I'm going to call for a, um, a, a vote on the motion to amend. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? No. 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 So the motion to amend fails with uh, on a 2-4 vote with commissioners um, Schifrin and Greenberg for and uh, the rest of us against. And then we are back to discussion on the main motion, com uh, Commissioner Conway's motion. Wants to lead that conversation next. Are we near end of discussion on that? Oh, I did want to discuss the, the uh, other recommendation, um, which has to do with the uh, amendment to the, uh, the section. That's the section that it is. It's on page four of the report. And uh, the planning director referred to this. This is the section of the inclusionary ordinance that really has to do with the maximum sales price. Um, and the recommendation was to add the language government code section 65589.5 or any other applicable code. I looked that up and it's like a not eight or nine page, it's the whole Housing Accountability Act. And my sense is that what the section that's relevant to the maximum sales price really was what the plan director said was subsection O, um, which deals with, because uh, this section says you can't really change maximum sales prices if certain things have happened. And what that section O says is if somebody submitted, an applicant submitted a, a preliminary application uh, and that's been accepted, then you can't change the maximum sales price. And I think that's state law, that's fine. I don't, I don't have any problem with that. I just think putting in our, in our ordinance something that will make it so much more complex for the public of anybody who tries to figure out what we're doing and have to read a nine page housing accountability bill to, I couldn't find that, I mean, I didn't take a lot of time. I couldn't find section O. So what, my recommendation is to approve the staff recommendation for this, um, for this change, except to have it say government code section 9.5, subsection O. And I'm just, I'd ask staff if that was an acceptable change to them. I just think it makes understanding the um, the the ordinance a little bit better, and I'd ask it. I'd ask that be accepted as a friendly amendment. Based is, on is that accepted as a friendly amendment? Um, I don't believe it makes it better, but I will accept it as a friendly amendment. I forget. Do we have to have the second? Yeah. Do you accept that as a friendly amendment? As the I just have a question um, to staff agree that that's that, that that's fine. I mean, did you guys look into it, and does that make sense? That is the subsection. <clears throat> I think it's fine either way. Um, it was it was initially left broad because other portions of that uh, code can um, be interpreted as interpreted as applicable. Um, however, the next clause there or any other applicable state codes. Um, so either way, it's fine. Adding subsection O certainly points them directly to one section that is definitely applicable. All right, thank you. I'll, yeah, that's, I'll accept that. So the, the amendment is that it's 6558950. Okay. Subsection O, letter O, not zero. Right. Mm. You have that as an amendment, a uh, friendly amendment? Okay. So other discussion? So we, um, I'll c ask for a roll call vote. Commissioner Schifrin? No. Commissioner Conway? Yes. Commissioner Nielsen? Aye. Commissioner Greenberg? Um, no. 
Commissioner Singleton. Vice Chair Spellman. Aye. Chair Pepping. Aye. So the motion passes 4 2. And do you have the eyes and nose? Okay, so thank you to staff for that. Um, it's unique to me anyway that we have a litigation settlement that comes to us and then council gives us part of it already decided and asks for more input. So thanks for trying to help us make sense of that. Um, if I could just add one thing, I forgot to acknowledge at the beginning two of our housing team who were here who did a lot of the background work um, for this meeting, and that's Jessica Miller, our housing program manager, and um, actually Jessica uh, DeWitt, our housing program manager, and, and Jessica Miller, <laughs> um, who is also um, part of our uh, integral part of our housing team. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for members of the community that came to share your opinion on this. The next agenda item, agenda item is information items. Do we have any? Yes, uh, just a couple of updates. Um, uh, the next uh, projects that the commission will be seeing are um, one, um, the Circles Church, um, uh, Eret Circle on the west side. Um, that is um, narrowing in on the, the final issues that it uh, is uh, uh, finishing up addressing and um, will likely be before the commission in the next couple of months, um, potentially in December, um, otherwise in January as uh, a likely timeline for that. And then um, there are um, various downtown plan uses that are proposed to be updated. Um, the commission will recall when we updated the downtown plan in um, 2017, we um, made some modifications to the uses that were gonna be amortized after a 20 year period. Um, particularly as they relate to alcohol uses. And that 20 year period is coming up in 2020, um, uh, just about a year from now. Um, so uh, October uh, timeline of 2020. And so um, we'll be bringing those alcohol related uses as well as um, auto related uses and um, some changes to personal service uses. Uh, in particular, tattoo parlors, which are now treated the same as um, any other personal service use. And um, then uh, relaxing some of the, uh, or a proposal to relax some of the requirements for personal services on sort of the periphery of downtown. And then also the uh, commission has been working, a subcommittee of the commission has been working on um, application uh, requirements. And it's my understanding that um, those will be um, coming up pretty soon. I don't know if uh, Vice Chair Spellman would like to speak to that. Um, and then there was a request at the last meeting related to uh, additional subcommittee work uh, for our advanced planning team that might be able to supplement some of the things that we're doing. So those are the things that are sort of in the hopper and that you can expect to see. Um, we do not expect to have a uh, regular meeting I believe it is on the 12th. Um, however, um, uh, we may have, or excuse me, uh, yes, uh, not on the, the, we're not expecting a special meeting on the 12th, which at one point was being considered. And um, we may be reaching out to you to uh, see if there is a quorum for the 19th, given its proximity to the holidays, but that would be a regularly scheduled meeting. So you're saying there's no, actually the re next regular meeting is the fifth, and you're saying they're not going to have a regular. We're not going to have a meeting on the fifth. I believe that's the case. I'm looking over here. Yes. So, we, don't have but we may have a meeting on the 19th. We may have a meeting on the 19th. Is it and possible that there'll be a meeting on the 12th. We don't have the we've, noticing. We've out passed that noticing out, yeah. so that's not an option anymore. Okay. Right. Yeah. We were we were targeting potentially doing that for some projects that might be there just because we're getting pretty close to the break on the 19th and wanted to um, you know, get a little bit farther in advance of that break and hopefully have people um, more likely to attend. But we couldn't make that, so we might be reaching out to you for the 19th. I'll just tell you right now, I'm not available on the 19th. Thanks for the heads up. Mm -hmm. Anybody else wanna share their availability? Staff? I'm not sure yet. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm available. Sure should be. Thank you. Yeah, we'll uh, appreciate that early heads up and um, we'll have uh, Tess send out an email or Sarah will send out an email. I had a question on the application subcommittee because in reading SB 330, it seemed like the state's not telling the city what 
has to be in the application and limiting everything else. So it's, I, I, I took it that it wasn't even going to be possible for the subcommittee to come back with anything that they came up with because the state is sort of we should look at that field. for sure. Are My, we talking about the streamlining of the process? Objective standards. No, that the, is just what would be in an application when, when a, somebody applies. What they what okay. they have to do. right, which is part of the streamlining. Yeah, so I, you know that would apply. To, I think to subjective, um, you know, requirements. I don't mm -hmm. think the work that we're doing is in that realm. This is more how do we present projects so we can easily understand what's happening. It's not a, a design style or. A, um, something of, of that yeah. ilk. It's more a basic um, submittal requirement that would get us more consistent um, documentation. Well, what I remember one of the concerns that you had was having information come to the commission that showed what was proposed, what was, what was around a particular project. And reading SB 330, you can't do that. You just, all they have to do is say what they're doing on the site. So that's why I was just concerned whether, I mean, I agree that what, what the subcommittee was working on was worthwhile. I just don't know whether, I mean, we can maybe ask developers to do it, but I'm not sure the city can require development, developers to present anything other than what's in the state law. I mean, I, I, mm -hmm. I, I, you, do you see that differently? I think one of the, if I may add, one of the concerns was that we were getting applications that had some kind of, you know, variance or didn't follow some of the requirements and there was no explanation for why. And we were hoping to have some kind of a form where they could say, you know, they're following this check it, and then in certain cases, no, and then give a reason. Where there was some kind of, um, you know, mindfulness on the part of applicants about actually trying to follow all the rules or explaining, you know, reasons for not. And so that would... Yeah, all of yeah. those are, are part of it. Yeah, right? and the, so that, regardless that piece, of what the rules um, are. Yeah. The good news is, is the bulk of that work is completed. And if it's not applicable, <laughs> I still think it's a better document than what we had before. If there are things that a particular project that's following some submittal from the state rules that doesn't have to apply, then they're going to just do what they want to do. But in general, it's a better document and we'll, you know, we'll have a better process because and of that. And that will be coming to the com commission? I would guess in January. Uh, we're close to finishing it up. It's being circulated to staff for final sort of comments and edits, and then we should have it ready to present. I could ask yeah. a question about that. Go ahead, Go ahead Commissioner Conway. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was just wondering if that's part of your analysis of what you're doing for your objective standards is, is this seems like it would be a perfect time to have that integrated. So um, a lot of responses to <laughs> the comments up there. Um, uh, SB 330 specifies um, the um, requirements that, um, that come into preliminary review applications. And um, it doesn't speak to the same uh, level of specificity for um, regular development applications, um, but it says that the city can develop a set of rules uh, and, and identify. We, just, we do need to clearly identify both for our preliminary review application and for our formal submittal application um, what the submittal requirements are and put those online for you know, the development community to see. Um, with... Uh, we will have some ability to um, still use subjective standards. Um, and so I think there, there may be some value in um, having the adjacent uh, uh, properties. We're just limited in how we use them. Um, and so we cannot use them to reduce the uh, number of dwelling units. We cannot use, use them to deny projects. And so um, this is all new. Um, you know, we are, uh, we're certainly learning here and um, we look forward to working with the commission as we learn, we'll share information with you. And uh, we look forward to um, having the subcommittees work benefit the, the application submittals that we have so that even if we've got a limitation on how we can use that information, we've got that information so that if we we do have the ability to use it um, to make the project better. We can do so. I think we're into oral reports for subcommittee and advisory reports, but yeah. <laughs> since we're already into that, did we skip any other information items? 
that was it for me. Okay. And then do you have a subcommittee well, update? Since I, on September 17th, went to a community meeting, I feel I should report on it, even though I, if I hadn't taken notes, I'd have no memory of it whatsoever. But there was a, uh, I, I was the only commissioner there. It's a project on North River Street. I don't know if it's moving forward or not. It seemed to be in a very early stage. Um, I think it was, um, it's a mixed use. To, it's taking the two parking lots that are on North River. There were 13 people at the, uh, at the meeting, uh, the CEQA doc document is going to be required. There are air quality and site stability issues. It's right against the cliff. So the people who are there were very concerned about that. You know, there's going to be office, 30 parking spaces underground, two levels of apartments, uh, 22 one bedrooms, four studios. And what the proposal was, was two inclusionary units. The, the developer's architect didn't seem to have an understanding of the city's requirements. So it was, a, an, it was an interesting meeting. Um, since now all of us can go to any of the meetings and just sit there and not say anything, I just sat there and didn't say anything. And I can understand the urge to say something <laughs> at these meetings because, you know, it's kind of like, wait a minute, there's a 15% requirement. But, I was good and I didn't say anything, but I guess it's, 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 uh, it's problematic. So <laughs> I did want to make that report. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other OR reports? With that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Julie.